Hey, I'm Ross from Waking Giants. Welcome to Waking Giants EDU to a lunch and learn with uh, Texas State Senate. Um, I'm just like, this individual is running for the Texas State Senate seat. So this should be an interesting conversation. Um, as we've learned, Senate races are very important. Um, some people know that already, a lot of people don't. But uh, we're gonna have a nice little conversation. We will reserve the last 10 minutes for Q&A from um, the individuals decided to come here. But let me take care of some housekeeping rules really quick. I'm the host moderator. I see all, but I'm not like a bad Sauron from Lord of the Rings, I'm like a good one. So just to let you know, um, I have executive functions like mute, remove, all kinds of things. Do us a huge favor and let's uh, keep the integrity of this conversation really clear audio wise. So if you could make sure your mics are mute. Um, they should be already muted, but uh, we will open it up at the end for Q&A. Um, just a little information about Waking Giants. Waking Giants is a social impact company. We provide um, businesses and, excuse me, <coughs> groups with the tools they need to fight the good fight. Um, we have cool interviews like this and lunch and learn. So we have yoga, we have um, Friday night Shabbat, we have uh, awesome, awesome authors on. Kate Schatz um, is going to be here. She did the Rad Women series, a really awesome illustrated book. So if you're an adult and you like graphic novels, but you also want something your kids can look at with you, awesome. She'll be on for um, a session with us. But um, without further ado, we're going to get into the goodness. Um, if you're not familiar with this individual, this individual has been a champion in our area um, behind things like bail bonds and health equity and uh, city planning, all kinds of good things like that that are very, very important. Was a judge here in Travis County for a while um, and actually swore in one of uh, the first black judges in the area and um, just overall someone who's trying to have conversations with real citizens and do things to make sure real citizens get to have good lives. So um, this is, I can't call her judge anymore because she's not a judge. So it's Sarah. Citizen. How are you doing today? I'm really, really good. How are y'all doing? I think everybody is good. Um, sorry, one more thing. Chat functions great. Please, if you guys have any questions, you can chat me. Um, Waking Giants host me. You can send me a direct chat. Um, try not to send Sarah a chat because um, she might not be able to pay attention to um, her chat box while we're chit chatting. So, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Good. Uh, despite some uh, pretty startling numbers across the state with COVID-19 and uh, some difficulty in getting the governor to to recognize the the um, the trajectory that we're on, um, I'm otherwise good. But we've got a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> We're coming out of the gate today, y'all. <laughs> so um, I have some questions for you in regards to how has the Travis County response to COVID, how has it been in your experience? We have a really, really good partnership here. I mean, it's not perfect. We certainly have our, uh, our arguments, uh, but people uh, locally, and I find this across the state in all of the major metro areas that the, the local leaders, both in the public and private sector, are really rowing in the same direction. Um, we are recognizing the facts on the ground and planning and preparing for the probabilities. Uh, and I feel good about that. Um, uh, just this morning, I was shooting off an email to the three uh, hospital network uh, uh, chief executives on hospital capacity locally. Uh, and trading text messages with Mayor Adler on next steps with regard to mutual aid on personnel. Sorry, this is my cat. Hey, Brett, say hello to everybody. <laughs> cameo. If you're not used to the Zoom pet cameo, I don't know if you should yeah. be here today. <laughs> yeah, not cameo. Um, so I, I do feel really confident that we have what it takes to uh, come together and in collaboration make some very difficult decisions uh, and plan for. Uh, um, what is bleak uh, in the near term, but could be a real opportunity for, uh, for systemic change in the long term. I'm not so confident 
that the state government is prepared to uh, make those sorts of decisions. And that's mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I am running for state Senate. Okay, okay, okay. So you have, you have a model you feel that could really impact on the long, t on the big scale, but there's some difficulty in communication. Okay, well, in, in, in that, I think, you know, the public also sees that um, in which what to abide by, what to listen to, you know, what personal measures have you and your family taken in regard to COVID? Sure, there's a lot of confusion out there about what is truly effective at reducing infection rate. And we can do this. Um, this isn't rocket science and it's not complex, but uh, we have received some confusing and conflicting messages uh, at the top, uh, both at the federal and the state level. But it is, uh, it is simple. Uh, it does take commitment, but it is simple to, it, and it sounds like, golly, this is what my grandmother used to say, but it's, it's that simple. You wash your hands, you maintain six foot social distance. Uh, you wear a mask when you are not with your household members, and you don't gather uh, in groups of people uh, for purposes that are not essential. Um, and if you're sick, you stay home until you're better. Uh, it's, it's really that simple. It's the same thing that your mother and your grandmother have told you uh, every flu se season since, uh, you know, since, since the beginning. Um, and we're not following those things. Um, wash your hands, six foot social distance, wear the masks. Uh, actually, I've got mine right here. I've ripped up every old t-shirt of mine, except for my favorite concert t-shirts, to make a, a mask in every color in the rainbow to go with every outfit. <laughs> um, and then also not to gather uh, in groups for non-essential purposes. That's the really hard part because we are social animals. So I'm the mother of two teenagers. Uh, at the beginning of this pandemic, I said, you're going to have to choose your COVID buddies. Uh, and don't go hanging out with people beyond your COVID buddies. So that I know that I have and we have a relationship with their households. And if anybody gets sick, uh, uh, we will share the information and we will share the responsibility of keeping each other well. Um, so my kids chose their COVID buddies. And then uh, George Floyd was murdered. And my daughter came to me and said, I can't stick with my COVID buddies. I have to go, um, I have to go protest. So we had some difficult conversations around that, uh, about what we would do in order to keep uh, our household safe. Uh, and uh, we all agreed that it was important for her to participate in those protests. And so she did. Um, and I'm very, very proud of her for that. Uh, and that was a risk uh, that the entire household was willing to take because it's that important. And I think the same for voting. Um, for those of us who are uh, unable to uh, qualify for the extremely and ridiculously narrow uh, uh, provisions for a uh, mail-in ballot, it is uh, uh, important enough to go in person and vote. And I'm really grateful for our election administrator here and election administrators all across the state of Texas for making it as, as safe as we possibly can. Um, so um, we, we need to consider our risks and consider on an individual basis what is essential and certainly uh, protesting police brutality and exercising your right to vote are essential. So that's the, the uh, uh, guidance I've been giving to my giving to my community as an elected leader and also the guidance I've been giving to my own children as a household leader. Okay, okay. Interesting um, that you talk about the essential nature of voting. You know, um, if you're reading the news right now, you can already hear what's going on in Kentucky in regards to not enough polling places despite populace um, or number of people who can access um, polls. Uh, how do you feel like that's going to go down in Texas? Have you, have you had your ear to the ground on how Texas is going to handle voting, um, specifically in your race and, and all the respective races? Travis County also is having a um, race, a runoff for district attorney. Um, so um, how do you think that's going to affect here and happen locally in Texas, voting-wise? 
well, I've been keeping my finger on the pulse of what's going on in Kentucky because one of my best friends in the entire world uh, lives in Frankfurt, the capital of Kentucky. And so she has been uh, uh, filling me in on what's going on there. And also I've been checking in uh, with Dana de Beauvoir here uh, as the Travis County clerk and also what's going on in Bastrop County. I feel confident that locally uh, we will have the volunteers uh, necessary uh, as well as the protocols and the equipment necessary. Travis County as a government has made available a uh, million dollars for uh, uh, additional protocols around voting, um, not only for the July election, but also for the November election. And so I feel confident that we'll have what's necessary. We will have the sneeze guards. Uh, we will have gloves, we will have masks, we will have tongue depressor type sticks in order to, to use the, um, uh, the polling pads so that people don't have to uh, touch them um, repeatedly. We'll have plenty of hand sanitizer and we will make this as safe as we possibly uh, can under the circumstances. Um, uh, I am not sure that every community across the state of Texas will be as prepared. Um, um, the state government exists to set a, a baseline of security for the entire state uh, rather than leave it to the locals to have wildly different um, protocols, but the state is not doing its part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, in, in regards to that, that kind of segues into COVID response, you know, um, with that also lack of communication. Um, do you know the current number of hospitalizations in, you know, Austin Travis County area versus the state of Texas? Well, I'll have to get my cat to get off of the piece of paper next to me. <laughs> uh, but currently we have uh, a little over 180 hospitalizations. Come on, cornbread, give me a little space here. 181. 181 hospitalizations. Um, we have a capacity of about 1,400 safe surge. Uh, um, but we are seeing a, a doubling time increasing. Um, we were at about a 45 day doubling time a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's been cut in half now with a considerable surge in cases. So um, over the weekend, I think uh, over the weekend, we saw three record topping days of positive cases. Uh, Sunday had 500 and 506 positive cases. Yeah. Um, that is uh, uh, five times what we saw uh, the Sunday before that. Um, the the seven-day rolling average has increased precipitously. And based on the modeling that we're seeing coming out of the University of Texas, which we have been um, partnering on since the beginning of March. I've got folders to the left of me filled with modeling data. Uh, we've been modeling uh, the spread of COVID-19 locally since the beginning of March. Um, and uh, this kind of surge was predicted uh, in the event that the governor reopened business in a reckless fashion. Mm -hmm doing a great job locally at flattening out the curve. And then the governor announced a three phase opening on a political calendar, irrespective of the facts on the ground. And uh, this kind of surge was predicted in March that that would occur. Uh, and here we are in June and it has. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so with, I think it said 101 or 181 current hospital. I think it was 181 current hospitalizations. 181. Um, is there a distribution in the data of where those patients come from? Because I know from being a Travis County resident, many of the rural communities depend on the hospitals and the level of trauma and ICUs here in Austin um, if they don't have the capabilities. So what is that looking like distribution wise? the number of cases that are from Travis County versus neighboring counties. Do you know what that looks like by any chance? That is a very, very important uh, aspect of these numbers. Our Austin Travis County Public Health Department is responding to a five county region. And bear in mind that a third, a third of the counties in the state of Texas have no hospital. So, um, uh, 
about half of the state's population uh, lives in the MSAs around the major metropolitan areas. Um, the, uh, the, the remainder of the population of the state of Texas is either traveling very long distances to get to those uh, major cities to get care, um, or they're not getting cared for. Uh, so um, we have been analyzing the statistics for what percentage is from within the city of Austin, within the, uh, the county of Travis, and then uh, individuals who are coming from elsewhere in the MSA. Um, I don't have the exact percentage uh, at my fingertips, but suffice it to say that uh, in our region, um, the, the preponderance of the population is inside Travis County. So certainly the vast majority of cases are gonna be from within Travis County, not because we're doing a worse job at curtailing the virus, far from it. It's just because our population is more dense. We just have more mm -hmm. people. Um, okay. But we are seeing uh, um, uh, transmission rates that are actually higher in the surrounding counties than they are inside of Travis County. Okay, okay. And for those who don't understand what MSA is, can we, sure. can we define that really quick? <laughs> Federal term, it's the Metropolitan Statistical Area and it's uh, uh, the feds uh, require, and I think this is a totally good thing, uh, require us to define sort of the catchment area of a major, uh, of a major city like the city of Austin. Um, and it's defined by uh, the counties uh, uh, surrounding that city um, that get to a certain level of population density reliant on that economic engine of, of that city. So the okay. five county MSA is Hayes, Williamson, Bastrop, uh, um, Travis, and Caldwell. Caldwell. Yeah. And then uh, uh, for, for metropolitan planning organization purposes, transportation purposes, Burnett is thrown in there too. So um, uh, Burnett is, is I, I class it as part of the MSA, even though uh, uh, technically our catchment area is five count. So with that actually um, defining what that is, that kind of leads me into my next question. So obviously, with the state being reopened, people's unemployment benefits have been given deadlines now, right? Um, and they have to look for work and businesses are cash strapped. And so a part of your unemployment is Medicaid or Medicare coverage if you're in need of it. And involving these MSAs or these um, metropolitan areas that surround, um, I was, a term that I like to use that someone else used, and I will cite them eventually, was that these counties are urban adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, and what is Medicaid and Medicare expansion going to look like, you know, on the state level in regards to these unemployment levels? Because, you know, you stay home, people get sick, people die. I mean, the bills to cover these hospitalizations, you know, ICUs are not cheap. That's absolutely true. And unfortunately, uh, um, state leadership and in, in the governor's office is relying on a survival of the fittest model. Uh, um, we know from before COVID-19 that the state of Texas was dead last in terms of uh, uh, insured uh, Texans. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely last, uh, because we are over-reliant on employer-provided uh, insurance policies. So now with considerable unemployment driven by COVID-19, you've got a twin disaster, both a health and an economic disaster of people who are both unemployed and have lost their health insurance. And they're in, uh, stuck between this vice of uh, uh, the uh, subsidized insurance on, on market and uh, Medicaid insurance for which we only provide for the absolute poorest of the poor. Right. Uh, so there are people who are falling in that gap, uh, who have lost their jobs and are looking, um, but do not have insurance. So it is, it is, in all probability, our uninsured rate has skyrocketed above 30%. Uh, currently, that, right at a time when we most need healthcare coverage. Right. So, uh, what we need to do, 
Uh, what has happened, which is good, uh, the requirements for uh, reestablishing eligibility under CHIP, which is the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, has been uh, a moratorium has placed, been placed on having to re-qualify. The fact that you have to re-qualify uh, um, at all is ridiculous. So I'm glad a moratorium has been placed on it and that should, should be made permanent. Uh, but also we need to pull down Medicaid. Um, we already pay for it in our federal uh, taxes and foregoing it is, is, is literally killing us. Um, we need to pull down Medicaid so that we can uh, insure folks uh, who are desperately in need of insurance. If people have insurance uh, and their families have insurance, they'll be able to work better, have a better peace of mind, and be better able uh, to take care of their families, their communities, uh, and to participate fully in our economy as it comes back up. You cannot be pro-business without being pro-worker, and you can't be pro-worker without making sure that folks have health insurance. So um, I would say uh, uh, get rid of the red tape on CHIP and on SNAP um, and pull down Medicaid and uh, help folks be resilient in their work search uh, by getting broadband, using this, these one-time federal dollars to expand broadband access so that people can get telemedicine, uh, education, training, and be qualified for jobs that are more uh, COVID-19 resilient uh, uh, through this pandemic. Okay. If you can't work from home, you can't work from home. Right, right. I mean, oh gosh, I could like ask you so many questions around that response alone, but um, in, I mean, it's, it's just very ironic how the survival of the fittest, how you use that term, you know, that's a, a term that scientists use to talk about, you know, the perpetuation or the continuation of the species, only the best of the best of the best or the healthiest of the healthiest move on. Um, which is really ironic because those who have to go to work every day are those that sustain our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so it's just very, very interesting to see the lack of protection for those who make sure the grocery stores stay stocked and right. you know so it's just it's very it's very odd to watch um so i'm really, really curious the scientific term but it was it was uh uh bastardized um as uh social darwinism darwin mm. never uh applied survival of the fittest to uh, to humans' capacity to adapt and share, mm -hmm. uh, and the 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 social Darwinistic idea was uh, um, was the underpinning of eugenics. And for those of you on the call who don't know what eugenics are, it was sterilization <laughs> of people involuntarily, so um, women mostly, and so um, yeah, it's just it's just very interesting to watch the the current climate in Texas and how it navigates and how it re it operates in respect of to surrounding states um, because places like Louisiana like Georgia Mississippi have these same situations where they have these urban adjacent counties that depend on that infrastructure so um, yeah thank you for your response I really appreciate that I'm so curious about like how do you envision yourself on as in in the senate seat how how because i know that when it comes to how texas politics go they have committees that handle all of these things um your responses remind me of something called the social determinants of health and all of these <laughs> all of these things that that wrap around how a person lives their life every day and so their access to education, their access to healthcare, where they live, things like that. That's one of the things I kind of picked up um, as I did my research about you. I, I found those very interesting pockets. But at the same time, Texas is one of those places where race matters. Mm -hmm. Yes, very much so. Um, so, you know, how does your being elected into Texas State Senate and what you want to do, how does that look across, you know, 
especially when it comes to equity. Because I mean, it's, it's equity, it's transportation equity, it's healthcare equity, it's educational equity. Um, how does that look from you being in the Senate seat? I have uh, long espoused a, uh, a three-part test for public policy in my, in my time as a commissioner and my time as a county judge. And it's kind of a, I'm gonna throw it out to you because I find that it's an elegant way to figure out how to move things forward. Uh, a, a policy initiative has to be effective, it has to be efficient, and it has to be fair. Um, so often when there's a policy initiative that's absolutely fair, and needs to move forward, but I can't get uh, Republican or very conservative folks to, to bite on the fairness issue, on the equity issue, I will pivot to an, uh, an efficiency issue. Look, if we don't uh, provide health care for uh, our, uh, our working families, um, they will end up um, uh, forestalling their care until uh, it's far more expensive uh, and take it to an emergency room and thereby be unable to provide for their families and then their families will have to uh, access some other type of assistance. So it is inefficient uh, for us not to provide health care. Now, of course, I think the people on this call will say, well, it's unfair <laughs> not to provide health care. Well, sometimes the fairness argument and the equity argument doesn't win the day with some of those folks in the pink dome. So um, I'll make a, an effectiveness and, a, and an efficiency argument. Um, it's not effective uh, because people can't show up for work and uh, business need, need labor. Uh, and it's not efficient because when folks do wait to go to the hospital until uh, their illness is much further on and the care is far more expensive, um, we end up paying more. If you're concerned about your local property taxes, you ought to be concerned about people not having health insurance because who picks up the tab for uncompensated care at the local level? We do in property taxes. So, but that's such, that's a whole, like that conversation about property taxes, local property taxes dropping into that pool of, of health care because Austin it's the drama of that is so real. The drama of that is very, very real. And it's actually the property taxes are coming out of the hospital district known as Central Health. Um, so the city and the county spun off our uh, uh, responsibilities for a public hospital into a hospital district. So it's your hospital district taxes, which are property taxes, um, that are picking up the dime for a clinic system that provides uh, um, uh, general health care to people who are low income. And it's a good clinic system. It's very, very good. Uh, but uh, again, if I have to pivot to an effectiveness and an efficiency argument, uh, that's the argument. If we don't provide health care to people, um, then you will be paying for health care on your property taxes locally. Can't hear you, Rosalind. <laughs> you muted yourself. <laughs> ah, I did my own Zoom mistake. Sorry, conversation's good. Conversation's good. So I'm like participating. Um, let me see what time it is. Okay, we're still good. Okay, so oh, I want to hold on to that property tax into the local, into that pool so much, but um, what else do you see for yourself in the Senate seat? I mean, I love the, the, the fact that you have, I mean, it shows that you're efficient by you having those three pools to jump into, um, but what is some of the pushback? Well, first of all, I wanna know what Calandra is eating for lunch. <laughs> Hi, Welcome. lunch for my husband. It's um, trout on bread. <laughs> trout on bread with an avocado? Yes, sorry, I'm multitasking. Sorry, I'm hungry. <laughs> um, what else do I see for my uh, for uh, uh, work in the Senate? Well, um, we need an economic recovery from COVID-19, and I think it's important for us to, and I know that this is a super unsexy topic, but this is a topic that is uh, very important to me and for which I have deep, deep uh, uh, study and understanding. We have to look at how we do, uh, how and who pays taxes in the state of Texas. Um, so the state of Texas, uh, for all kinds of political reasons, has 
um, uh, skirted its responsibility for analyzing what resources the state of Texas is actually bringing in and how sustainable those resources are. Um, so oil and gas revenues are volatile and they're down. Sales tax revenues are extremely susceptible to economic downturn right when you need to be leaning in and providing services. And so sales taxes are down as well. Gas taxes are down because our cars have become more fuel efficient, which is a good thing, but we haven't indexed the gas tax or replaced it with anything. Uh, there was an attempt to augment it with coal taxation, uh, but that hit a brick wall and it's been tossed out as well. Um, there is the rainy day fund, but the rainy day fund is one time money. And there's also federal stimulus money, but it also is one time money. So the state of Texas, uh, we are a wealthy state, but the, the state level uh, um, political powers refuse to tax appropriately to meet our ongoing constitutional obligations for education, healthcare, justice, transportation, and a host of other things. So we need some adults to sit down at the table um, and speak some hard truths to one another and to listen to some hard truths from one another and then to stay at the table and recalibrate how and who pays taxes in the state of Texas. Um, that won't happen overnight and it won't happen in one legislative session, um, but by sustained attention um, and continuing to work those, uh, those relationships inside the Pink Dome and also in the community at large, I think that we will get there because we have to. Uh, hmm. we, we cannot go on without a without effective state government. Hmm. It is neither effective, efficient, or fair uh, to continue limping along without an effective state government. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be kind of a really nice person because I'm really liking these questions that are coming in. Um, I think there's some good ones in here. So Kristen asked, how can we as citizens influence the state to put those voter safety guidelines in place? Also Cornbread, she loves the cat name. Yeah, why thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the way we do that is by building uh, um, coalitions outside the political sphere. Uh, um, I think we, we go to elections administrators all across the state of Texas, uh, as well as community leaders, irrespective of party, to say that we absolutely need everyone's voice at the table in order to be maximally resilient moving forward as a community. That when you leave out uh, um, the voices of large portions of our population, we become less resilient uh, economically, but also socially. Um, that's been clear in the civil rights protests over criminal justice reform. Um, uh, and I, I think that uh, that's, that's the way to win hearts and minds over the, the, the really cynical disenfranchisement of large percentages of our population. I mean, when you talk about criminal justice reform, I just think about Texas prisons. That's a major industry, well, not a major industry, a ma major <laughs> profit generator, we're going to say. Yeah. And, you know, you worked on the bail bond mm -hmm. board, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. you know, and it's been shown now, I mean, I would believe this is data being collected that prison populations are extremely high risk and the um, transmission rate is exponentially high. I mean, how does one justify not minimizing bail funds for certain offenses or letting people stay home instead of subjecting them to being placed in an environment that exponentially increases the chance of their death? Um, criminal justice reform is something that really requires sustained attention and we cannot let down that attention. It cannot be uh, uh, politically convenient to just dip in every once in a while and make a tweak here and a tweak there. Um, uh, I have often said that the criminal justice system is a sharp and heavy sword um, and it should not be swung unless uh, a person has become a danger to society. And those are really the index crimes. I'm gonna wonk out with y'all for a moment. I'm an ex-prosecutor, 
Um, I'm a lawyer. I've got a master's in public affairs. I've uh, done uh, assault family violence cases. I've done environmental enforcement. I've sat on the bail bond board. I've, you know, uh, I've done a lot of stuff in criminal justice. Um, the index crimes across the nation, which are the really bad stuff, rapes, murders, uh, armed robbery, uh, the people who are who have who have perpetrated or alleged to have per been perpetrated an act that's truly dangerous to society, index crimes have not increased as a as a uh, uh, on a per capita basis in the United States in decades. So why has our jail population increased? Because I, mean, I, have, I have my own personal responses to that. <laughs> of drug and alcohol related arrests. Um, we have, uh, particularly in the state of Texas, so neglected our responsibilities in health care and particularly in mental health care uh, to address drug and alcohol uh, dependency and the industry that grows up around that dependency. Um, instead, we have addressed it through the criminal justice system, um, which, you know, nobody should be getting diagnosed and then uh, prescribed with a course of treatment by a judge and their defense attorney, uh, much less by a cop on the street who chooses to arrest you or worse yet, uh, assault you or even kill you because you are suicidal. Um, uh, or in a uh, psychotic episode or in a drug-induced psychotic episode. Uh, and, and we see this far too often. Um, I have a little bit of sympathy for a cop that goes out on a call and is faced with somebody in mental health crisis uh, without any of the training or the expertise or, the, or frankly, the personality type to address it. Uh, but I don't have any sympathy for a cop who doesn't then call the mobile crisis outreach team at our local behavioral health authority to come out and, and take over that incident. Um, and that too often happens. Um, so um, we really do need to make a, a much deeper investment in mental health care, um, alcohol and substance use disorder. Um, and then also we need to demilitarize and defederalize our police. Um, our local police are here to protect us, not to wage war on us. And third, when we've got a, a police officer who's, who is assaultive, we need to be able to investigate them and prosecute them with independence and transparency. Um, and that's, n those three things are not happening currently in the state of Texas. It is so ironic, like, not ironic, that's not the word I'm looking for, um, listening to you speak about, you know, these various points, because, you know, again, they're all connected, mental health, criminal justice reform, uh, insulating and beefing up our health um, insurance and healthcare system, but, you know, taking account for each other's basic needs. Um, ah, so many, I'm like, ah, I got questions, but I'll give it back to the people who want to ask questions. Another question, which goes back into the economic um, bounce back. Can you talk a little bit about, this is from Lori um, Felker Jones. Can you talk a little bit about the Tesla deal and how incentives are or are not responsible choice for our region, perhaps particularly now given the economy? Great question. Absolutely. Uh, and this is, this is really an area where policy needs to, uh, policy always needs to recognize the facts on the ground. So if you get locked into a policy position and say you will never change, irrespective of the facts on the ground, that's not a good thing. Uh, it's the same thing for COVID-19. Um, uh, you know, as the facts change, you, you need to be able to surf those, those changes. So my position, which will not change with regard to preferential tax treatment, is that uh, government should not be putting its thumb on the scale of a specific enterprise unless that specific enterprise shows significant public benefit that is measurable and if it doesn't materialize, the enterprise pays it back. Um, so that will never change for me. Um, government is not in the business of business. <laughs> Um, government is in the business of developing a level playing field so any business can flourish on that level playing field. 
So the best incentive for business is to provide quality health care, quality public education, good transportation infrastructure to move goods, services, people, and information around the state, uh, clean air, clean water, uh, um, and those kinds of public pool resources um, that would make any business thrive here and any person operating in or owning a business thrive. That's the best government incentive for business. Now, in a major economic downturn, um, and also when we see major, major disparities in opportunity, I have told the Chambers of Commerce that if they find a, a, a large employer who will employ local residents in low skill and mid skill jobs that have career trajectory, and will locate in a low opportunity area and will guarantee results, particularly in uh, green industrial technologies or some other uh, uh, policy preferred industry um, that I would consider uh, preferential tax treatment for a limited duration to prove up the model. Um, Tesla may be that. I am not a decision maker on the Tesla deal although it will be put through the lens of an economic development policy that I wrote. Sorry, I, this is a good conversation. I listen. I really like to listen. So, um, guys, sometimes it's hard to have a good conversation and moderate at the same time. And I'm also watching you guys in the chat. Um, so, it's interesting, you know, Lori asked that question about Tesla, because if you don't know here in Texas, there has been a very contested relationship between tex Texas and Tesla. Mm -hmm. So um, given COVID, I'm really curious also on how that's going to develop um, in regards, but I really do like that approach um, in regards to green industries. I'm just curious because there's previous history in regards to Tesla, how that's going to play out. Well, that's the thing. Elon Musk does not have a good, a, a, a good reputation with regard to um, uh, labor. And, and we have to recognize that. You can uh, negotiate a contract, a good tight contract, as long as you enforce that contract that has clawbacks in case uh, um, Tesla doesn't perform. And so I am not in those negotiations, but like I said, the policy that I helped write uh, uh, does, um, anticipate that there would be a contract with deliverables and there would be no abatement or rebate of taxes unless and until the, the entity performed, uh, did produce the jobs, uh, and that those jobs were full time and that there wasn't high turnover and uh, that the benefits were there and uh, that the green technology did uh, did materialize. I'll give you an example. I don't think I voted for a single preferential tax treatment deal as a Travis County commissioner or a Travis County judge with the exception of two solar fields. And in both instances, the solar fields had to produce a certain amount of energy to go onto the ERCOT grid before they got any benefit. Hmm. Uh, and I think that those are good tight deals. Hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things I it's so weird. It's one of the things I love about Texas, but one of the things I've never understood Texas to tap into, which is solar and wind energy. Um, you know, driving through from I-10 from El Paso to Austin, you know, one of my favorite, you know, Ozuna, Sonora, all that area where you see all the wind farms and then also up towards um, Fairfield and East Texas, you know, it's, it's one of those things that make sense, but we don't understand why. I mean, there's, there's, and understanding why, but it's not, you know, an anecdotal thing. Um, the largest of wind energy in the nation. And it's just so odd that it's, we don't upscale it, you know? We, you know, and that's another uh, issue there, the, the, um, the 313 and 314 provisions for tax abatements for wind and solar and all energy uh, supports actually are up for sunset this legislative session. Um, and that's something that absolutely has to be looked at because we need to see um, what industries need incentivizing and which ones don't. Uh, and I would submit to you that um, fossil fuel uh, uh, resources do not need incentivizing. Um, but uh, solar and wind most definitely do. 
So uh, that's something to be uh, very vigilant of in the next legislative session. Okay, okay. Well, let's see what time, we got time for another question. Good. You, this is from Sean. Do you ever find yourself having to sacrifice one of the three in order to win others based on one of the other three. I think this is regards to efficient, effective, yeah. Yes, Sean, I mean, you raise a really good point. I'm always looking for balance. And sometimes you have to, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be upfront with you. I could either be, uh, I, I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. If I can get the good, uh, um, but not the perfect, yeah, I'll take the good. So I'll give you an example. In pulling up a public defender's office, we fought literally for decades to get a public defender's office in Travis County. Uh, and I was part of that fight. So we did camel's noses under the tent for a good while. First, we brought in a mental health public defender's office and it was small and didn't really pull enough cases. It made uh, some difference and I'm very proud of that difference. Then we brought in a capital area private defender service that that helped um, uh, raise the, uh, the quality of private defense attorneys in the criminal space. And that did help some, uh, um, but it, it still was not enough. And then finally, we, uh, I saw a break in the wall and along with a bunch of other people who've been working on this for a really long time, we, we rushed through that hole uh, of opportunity and pulled up an adult public defender's office. And, Will it have the capacity to represent all of the defense uh, um, needs in the state? I mean, in the county? No. Uh, initially, it will only have the capacity to do maybe 10% of the cases. And even in its ultimate uh, um, form as currently planned for, it will only be able to represent 30% of the defendants in the criminal case cases. So yes, for... Um, Efficiency reasons, uh, I, I could not win the day with a public defender's office large enough to represent all of the defense needs. Um, so I took 30% as a win. Uh, that was a balance between budget. Uh, um, that, that was definitely a balance between effective, efficient, and fair. It was certainly uh, effective, efficient, and fair for those who will get that representation. And we will have to balance that against those who get uh, private defense uh, um, assignments and make sure that those private defenders are as good uh, um, or take them off the wheel for appointment. So is it perfect? No. Uh, but it is certainly more effective, efficient, and fair than what we had before. Okay. It's just I hear that, but then I also hear, you know, private defender, cost of a private defender, cost of mental health, if this is involving some complex mental health, no insurance, like, I'm, you know, just, that's what's, I'm, 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 there's a lot here. Well, um, bring it on home. 90% <laughs> uh, of that criminal defense cost for indigents is on your property taxes, your local property taxes, 90%. So we are relying on these defense attorneys and judges, like I said, to make uh, um, uh, determinations about people's health and prescribing a, a course of treatment rather than putting it in the, the healthcare context. Which is odd because in Travis County over, or in Austin, sorry, let me make sure I quote this correctly, over 40% of my property taxes go to police. Uh, yes, uh, about half of your city of Austin property taxes and sales taxes, because they have both property tax and sales tax, uh, about half of their budget goes to a uh, uniformed first responder, whether it's police, fire, or EMS. That's true. Which is so interesting to me because when it comes to EMS and fire, you know, I'm a Travis County resident. I drive all over Travis County. At one point, I was between all the counties. Um, I did work for Medicaid in Travis Star Kids, I mean, Texas Star Kids. So, Great. thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, um, 
one of the things that really startled me is knowing that, but also not seeing firehouses, not seeing these infrastructures in certain aspects. And so it was just like, it's one of those things I'm really, really curious about how this is going to develop, um, especially as certain areas of Austin have become gentrified or is, are booming, you know, Northwest and all these other things, you know, how it's odd as someone who lived also in Northwest Austin, this is anecdotal, not reflective of waking giants at all. Most definitely saw the cops before I saw a new fire station. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the volume of construction that's happening, I, I personally don't think I want the cops to show up for an apartment fire. I'm just personal. And, and this is something we, we do not have an effective or efficient distribution of emergency response resources across the county, much less across the state. So we have developed what's called automatic aid agreements uh, across the local counties, the central Texas counties, so that when there is a fire or a flood, um, we can uh, come to each other's defense. So we've had two deadly floods in one year in 2015, the uh, Halloween and the Memorial Day floods. Um, we had, of course, the complex fire that started in Bastrop, but we also had fires uh, on the Perdinalis and in Steiner simultaneously. And little known fact, we also had grass fires in Southeast Travis County and Northeast Travis County that same day. Uh, so uh, we, we do not distribute our first responder resources well, and then you get, um, you know, a, a sort of a lumpiness. Um, um, I, have, I have joked before, and it's, it's probably not the funniest joke in the world, that if somebody has a, um, uh, if somebody has a heart attack uh, at Lamar and 10th Street, you will get two cop cars, a fire truck, and a box ambulance within three minutes. Uh, that's a lot of equipment <laughs> personnel. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> um, but if you live in Del Valle, um, you'll be waiting probably 11 to 14 minutes um, before uh, um, a paramedic can show up. Part of that is, is distance, terrain, um, but part of that is just that we are not distributing our resources uh, equitably. Mm -hmm. um, I have an, another question from uh, Lori. What do you need most right now to help put you in the Senate seat? What I need most right now is a groundswell of people in Bastrop and Travis County to get uh, out to all their friends and say this race is important and we need somebody who looks at big picture solutions and will work tirelessly 365 days of the year to achieve those solutions for us. It's not enough to just gather every other year in the Texas legislature to, to argue um, and look good doing it. Um, we're going to have to look for overarching systemic solutions and then build the coalitions to take into the capital with us rather than expect that the, the, the alliances that already exist in that building uh, will, will carry us to the next shore. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things I learned um, when I toured the Capitol building, that was very interesting to me is I learned the length of relationships that certain people have on committees and things like that. And I know, you know, Texas is known for being a huge lobby state, the power of the lobby, but, you know, even more so the power of a relationship can really prevent things from moving. Um, okay. Let me push back on that. Cause I think that, I think that this is a boogeyman. I think that the lobby is a boogeyman. Hmm, uh, really? We, uh, um, one of my opponents has uh, half a million dollars from the lobby. Uh, the, 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 I grew up in politics. <laughs> so this is probably, you know, not a great admission for me to make in a campaign, but I grew up in politics and uh, the lobby is scared. They're very mm. risk averse. They like mm. to go to a known quantity. And that's the reason why one of my opponents has so much money because he's a known yeah. quantity. And he's definitely in the legislature no matter what. Um, but they are, they are, uh, as a, as a class, they are afraid and they mm. 
always been that way. If you give them a reason to not be afraid uh, and you give them cover, if you, if you lead them to a better way um, that puts them in a better position, puts their client uh, in a better position for the future, um, the lobby, we're all human beings are pack animals. We're, we're like cornbread or really more like his, his dog friend, buddy. <laughs> we're, we're pack animals. Was if that they, meow food? That's, that's, <laughs> actually, that's actually, um, if, 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 uh, if there's a leader who will set a course with promise, we follow that leader. And that's the genius of democracy and human beings, that we are adaptive. When we are given a narrative and, and a future that looks better than the one that we have, we move toward it. I, 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 I'm processing that because um, something that would make sense is, is telling someone who owns, you know, large amounts of property to install solar, you know, or section out a portion of their acreage for solar energy, things like that. I mean, I personally can think of a lot of things, but um, one of the things of being a resident of Texas has shown me is, is it's very interesting and it, the type of grit and tenacity that you need to have in order to cause change has to be long-standing. Exactly, Rosalind. That's exactly, yeah. it's tenacity. So I'll give you an example of getting uh, uh, corporate entities and large businesses to move to solar. Um, hold, on, hold on, quick. Let me check the time, sorry. Sure. Oh, can we go over just a little bit? Just a little bit? Like five minutes? Can we steal you for five more I'm minutes? Good, if y'all are good. Okay, cool. Thanks guys, sorry. Five more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> sorry, I just realized I was like, ah! One of the reasons why businesses don't convert to solar is because uh, the, the upfront cost is significant. And if they sell that property uh, before they recover that upfront cost, it's sunk cost. So it's, it's just pure economics. So um, there was a good piece of legislation at the state called the PACE program that was instituted. Uh, and Travis County was the very first one to adopt it. And all we needed to do was uh, work with businesses and say, you know what? We will, uh, you can take a loan from a private bank and put the assessment on your property that runs with the property. So even if you sell it, the future owner is paying the assessment for the upgrade to solar or gray water capture, recapture or what have you. So that the improvement, the, the benefit of the improvement and the cost of the improvement runs with the land. This is, you know, this isn't rocket science. You find what the challenge is for them and you overcome it with them. So it enhances the value of their property. They get more money if they sell it and they save more money if they keep it. Win-win. So we should expand the PACE program. <laughs> yes, but it's also, you know, I'm, I'm interested, you know, tenacity is, is that thing is, is when oil and gas have been legacies and families, it's really hard to have that conversation to change a legacy, just like ranching, just like a lot of the, I guess you call stereotypical Texas institutions that we have here. Um, you know, that conversation is, is most definitely very difficult, but it also reminds me of the conversation that you talked about, you had with your daughter, of whether or not you want to protest, you know, yeah. um, it's, it's about fundamental change and you have to have those hard conversations to have fundamental change, you know? And so, yeah, tenacity and grit is one of those things that it's interesting, like for you to be, you obviously hit all the, the experiential qualifications of a Senate candidate, but you know, that those two things are, are really, really interesting to have in a candidate because, you know, Texas is tough you know, and, and tough in a way that isn't always good for it. That's true. I mean, you talk about tenacity and grit, and those are two words that seem synonymous with the Texas mystique. I'm a sixth generation Texan. Um, the, the necklace around my neck is the cattle brand from my family's, you know, from the cows my, my family took in exchange for, you know, bolts of fabric at Indianola before it got blown away by a hurricane. Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, you know, uh, all of us are afraid of change. Um, but as a mentor of mine once said, you don't quit a bad habit, you replace it with a better one. And yeah. so that's what our challenge is. We have to recognize that everybody's afraid of change and that no one wants to, uh, uh, no one will, will quit a bad habit until they are uh, offered uh, uh, the replacement of a better one. And um, I have a personal credo that uh, everybody is welcome, including me, and nobody's an enemy forever, including me. So if I can keep that in my head, even as people are saying outrageous, stupid, harmful, uh, really difficult things to say, and then try and hear past that to uh, what are you afraid of? And what can I offer you to replace your fear with something hopeful that you're willing to take a risk for? Um, I think we'll all be better if we can continually, continually ask that. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Whoa. That's well, guys, we did it. I'm like, I'm like, I want to keep talking, but we only had an hour and that's fair. Yeah. So um, but I want to help out. I've got a website, sarahecart.com. Just go on that website. I've also got a Facebook. So if you just go to Sarah Eckhart Austin, it'll pop up. Um, love to have your support. Um, this is going to be an interesting race. Uh, I, I would love to win it without a runoff <laughs> because Senate District 14 needs representation now. Um, uh, so help me out on this. I would love to, to uh, represent you in the, in, the, in the Senate and in the Pink Dome. It'd be super. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I just kept having to define for anyone who wasn't here what the Pink Dome was. I've used that term outside of Austin. They're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, never mind. Sorry. The Capitol building. Forgive me. Forgive me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciated the time and the hour. Um, really excited to see what you're going to do in the future. And hey guys, come back to Waking Giants. We do good things. Hey, side note, we have Dahlia Garza, who's also running for county attorney in Travis. She's going to be on on Friday at noon Central Standard Time. And then um, hopefully um, we'll get a confirmation to have Jose Garcia, who's running for um, district attorney here in Travis County. So come back, hang out with us, check out our book club, um, check out our website, wakinggiants.me. But most importantly, bet and read about your election candidates. This is one of them, um, Sarah Eckhart. Please contribute to her campaign and take care of yourselves, guys. Thanks. Bye. Nice Thank you so much.